It's The Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams, producer and host. This is the podcast where we talk about birds, bird nerds, all the people trying to do something about preserving birds, and the um, ever-growing and seemingly never-ending problems that confront them in their quest to continue to exist. And of course, what we're about is not thinking about doing something, getting off your butt and actually doing something. It's May 8th, World Migratory Bird Day. And to mark that occasion, I wanted to focus on two migratory species that have captured the hearts of a city and are important in two different places at other sides of the globe. It's my pleasure to speak with Mr Terry Townsend, the energy, the driving force behind birding in Beijing and somebody who certainly does take action. Terry, thank you for joining me on The Bird Emergency. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm looking forward to this discussion. I've been really keen to broaden the sort of focus. Obviously, in a, in a new podcast, in a new venture, you sort of go with what you know. So we've been very Aussie-focused, even though there's quite a few issues coming up where I've spoken to people internationally. But China's a, a kingpin, no matter which way you look at it, in birds, in all of the conservation matters for birds in so many regions because so many migratory birds either mm-hmm. either pass through there or well they they're heading to Australia, New Zealand, they're going to Africa, they're going to Europe. How did you get sort of the bird bug? How did I get the bird bug? Well, that goes back a long way, I have to say, because I think my my earliest memory of being interested in birds is when I was about 4 years old. So I was born and brought up in a, a rural village in, in Norfolk in England, right by the coast, small village called Winston-on-Sea. And uh, I remember you know, looking out of the back window of my parents' house and seeing birds in the garden and, and asking my parents what, what they were. And they had no real knowledge of, of birds, so they bought me a book. And I just started to teach myself about the different birds that were visiting the garden. And I was very fortunate that I was raised close to a nature reserve. So we not only had the ocean just next door, but also a dunes nature reserve just a few minutes walk away. And that really sparked my interest further. And it just went from there. So, yeah, it's odd because there's, you know, nobody in my family is interested I didn't meet another birder until I was well into my teens. So it was a, a bit of a lonely pursuit, I have to say, and I thought I was a bit weird. But, yeah, it, it comes from somewhere, not sure where. Well, I don't think that's a unique experience for birders of a, of a certain <laughs> age. I, I was certainly the only, um, the only kid lugging bird books around in their backpack in my teenage years. Terry, you've been in Beijing for about 10 years. I think. Is it longer than that? It's just over 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. 10th anniversary, end of August. How did you end up, what was the journey from the seaside in Kent all the way to to a decade-long stay in Beijing? (sighs) Yeah, how long have you got? (laughs) It's quite a long story. But to cut it short, I mean, essentially I was, before I I came to Beijing, I was actually living in Copenhagen in Denmark and working for an NGO uh, on environmental law, international environmental law. And um, we were working with legislators from many different countries, including China. And we were running a process at that time looking at climate change legislation. And uh, we used to every year produce a report about climate change related laws in uh, the major economies. And at one of our meetings, the Chinese delegation said that we're going to start developing a general law on climate change, which at that time was you know, huge news that a country of you know, China's size was considering developing climate change law. And they invited my NGO to input to that process because we had a lot of knowledge about what other countries had done, 
what worked, what didn't work, and what might be applicable in China. So and I, I was leading that process at the time. So it made sense for me to, to be the one who, who came and supported that effort. So I came to, to Beijing at just a few weeks' notice and uh, worked with the National People's Congress and the National Development Reform Commission to uh, inform the development of their draft law. And initially it was for a year, which turned into two years. And then after two years, the NGO that I was working for lost its funding overnight because they were working with members of parliament. And you may remember a few years ago, there was a big scandal in the UK about members of parliament expenses. And suddenly the UK government and European governments who provided quite a significant amount of funding to the NGO that I was working for, suddenly got nervous about funding MPs to go overseas for meetings. So so literally overnight, we lost a lot of funding, which meant that the, the NGO became unviable. So I was sort of stuck in Beijing, you know, just lost my job. And it was like, well, okay, what do I do next? Do I go, go back to the UK and get another job? Or should I try and make a go of it in China? And I'd really enjoyed my two years in China. I love the people. I love the places. Amazing country. So it's vast and has some fantastic wild places, unique wildlife, lots of unique birds. And I just thought, okay, let's try and make a go of it. So I sort of set myself up as an independent consultant, initially working on climate change legislation with the Chinese government and with other organizations. And it's just developed from there, really. So now I focus most of my time on wildlife conservation. And I've just been very fortunate to to, to find opportunities that enable me to to stay here and to work here. And obviously, given the size of China, things you do here can make a difference, make a big difference. So just a small change, given the scale of China, can make a big difference. So I've been extremely fortunate to, to have opportunities that have allowed me to to grow what I do here. And and now, I'm 10 years later, I feel very settled here and, and love what I'm doing. So I feel very lucky. I was really pleased to get the opportunity to speak to you because when you're sitting in a country like Australia that has a government that is on one hand reliant on China in the trade sphere, but on the other hand, having this continual joust with the Communist Party, and we now have a situation where our journalists have fled the country and we're being, as tourists, warned against going there, it's really easy to join in the sort of um, old war mentality and hear about Western countries justifying their complete inaction or inability to move forward with any sensible climate policy and energy policies, they blame everything on China and India. It's always China and India haven't done this, so why should we? But it seems to me that China has taken the preservation of its own natural environment in the last five, maybe stretching out to 10 years, really seriously. Now, you've been there. Is that a fair assumption? Are they really making steps to preserve what they've got? Yeah, I mean, it, it's there's a long answer and it's a short answer. I mean, what I would say is that certainly over the last few decades, China has experienced astounding economic growth. That has come at an environmental cost. So we all know about the, the problems that China has had with, with air pollution, for example. That's probably the most visible example. And that was the sort of most obvious symptom of, or price you know, that was paid in terms of China's breakneck growth for so long. But I think what you've seen in the last five years in particular is a real recognition that this cannot continue the way that they'd grown previously, couldn't continue. And this sort of growth at all costs approach it was no longer appropriate. I think you know, this is common around the world. Once people reach a certain level of the environment becomes more important, and you know, particularly for the middle classes you know, who live in the cities like Beijing, they needed to do something to improve the environment. Otherwise, they're going to lose their best talent. They're going to also have high costs in terms of health, days lost at work and, and things like that. So in the last few years, there's been a big effort to tackle air pollution. I mean, it's so much better now than it was five, ten years ago. 
um, the number of, of days where the pollution requires you to wear a mask, uh, I could count on the fingers of one hand, you know, the last 12 months. So it's, it's much better. And I think, you know, this is part of a pattern too in terms of China's um, strategy. So, yeah, President Xi has this vision of eco-civilization. Yeah, people say, well, what, what does that mean? And things, but at its basic sense, it's about harmony between the economy and the environment. And I think if you look at underneath the rhetoric, there are some policies, serious policies that have been implemented over the last few years to to demonstrate that this is not just you know top level words. Um, China's developing national park system, which will be launched this year. They've been piloting um, national parks across the country. So this is sort of to preserve and celebrate China's you know, most important natural heritage. And they've got amazing wildernesses on the Tibetan Plateau in a place called San Jiang Yuan, which is literally means the three river sources. So it's the source of the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, and the Mekong River. You know, three rivers that, that combined supply hundreds of millions of people in Asia with fresh water. That is a vast area. It's an amazing wildlife, snow leopards, brown bears, and common leopards, wolves. It's amazing density of predators. And that area is now a pilot national park. It will be a formal national park later this year. They've got areas, obviously, in northeast China with the Amo tiger and um, deserts in in, uh, in Mongolia. Uh, they've got really unique wildlife and temperate forests in Sichuan, uh, Yunnan also in the southwest. So there's a, there's a big push to protect the most important natural heritage through the national park system. And there's been a lot of strengthening of laws and enforcement too. So the wildlife protection law, the environment protection law, both been strengthened. There's been a lot more resources put into enforcement. Uh, the, the Ministry of Environment has been elevated in terms of its seniority in government. And of course, for those interested in birds, probably you're all aware that recently sites in the Yellow Sea, which are the, you know, is a hugely important hub for migratory shorebirds, migrating from the Arctic to Australia, New Zealand and back, have been selected as nominated and approved as World Heritage Sites uh, with another bunch of sites due to be given that status in the next few years um, and a ban on further reclamation of, of uh, coastal wetlands. So all of these things, you know, are really positive. And I think a few years ago, we'd have it's sort of almost turned from a situation of despair to, to one of hope. I mean, obviously, all of these things combined are not the answer. They're not the final answer. They're not going to protect everything. But it shows that there's an intent and a direction of travel that I think is is very positive so so yeah it's good to that, hear yeah. that something positive is there and that it seems to be genuine time will tell hopefully china yeah. hasn't fallen completely under the the spell of the pr wizards that operate in the west so that here we can re-announce the same policy and the same the same nominated expenditure four or five times and still get a PR hit out of it every time. And then, yeah, but anyway. Let, yeah, there, I, I, there is a sort of a misconception that, that you know, China has one political party, essentially, and therefore they don't have this politic that we, that we see, obviously, in the West. But, I mean, I think they do have politics within the Communist Party. There are different factions. There are different interests. We just don't see it played out in the media in the same way that, that we do in the West. So the same debates happen, the same interests, the coal lobby, the, the dirty energy lobby are very powerful. And, and these debates and you know, policy discussions are happening internally exactly the same way, but we just don't see them played out in the media because they don't have to you know, present to the public that this position is better and we, we want to win votes because they don't obviously have to do that. It's played out behind closed doors. Well, let's turn our attention specifically to birds for a few minutes. What are the iconic species that require protection in China? Now, I'll get you to talk more specifically about the Beijing Swift and and the cuckoo, (laughs) because I know there's specific programs for them. But are there a number of really imperiled endangered species in China? 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, I mean, one that's obviously very well known is the spoonbill sandpiper, which is not a breeding bird in China. It actually breeds up in the, in the northeast Siberia. But China is arguably the most important country for that bird because they, where they molt after breeding and quite a few high percentage of the population winters also in the China coast. And that's a critically endangered bird, which is down to just a few hundred individuals. So that's a really endangered species. And there's a lot of work going on along its flyway. So on the breeding grounds, there's a head starting program where they take the first clutch of eggs and rear them, allowing the the wild pair to, to relay. And that has been a big success in terms of increasing the number of, of young that successfully fledge. And then there's been efforts in China, obviously, on the Yellow Sea to protect some of the key sites. And to just mentioned the World Heritage Sites, the two of the important sites for Spoonbill Sandpiper have been given World Heritage status, which means they have you know, real hard protection commitments in China to, to protect those sites. And then there's been a lot of work also in the wintering grounds, you know, in South China and uh, some of the Southeast Asian countries in Myanmar, Cambodia and places like Bangladesh to deal with the threats that they face there, which includes trapping and, and habitat loss. So there's a big international effort right along the flyway to try to save the spoonbill sandpiper. Um, but there are many other species too. I mean, Chinese crested tern is another one that's really critically endangered and was actually went missing for several decades and then was rediscovered breeding on tiny islands um, between the mainland and Taiwan. And yeah, it's been a big effort there, successful to increase the, the population, but it's still nevertheless very low numbers. There's species like bear's pochard, which is a critically endangered duck, whose population has crashed in the last few decades, and we don't really understand why um, necessarily. So there's a lot of work going on now with that species, which is great. There's uh, Yankoski bunting, which is another often overlooked bird, brown, small brown job. Uh, lives in in Mongolia, away from most people. Doesn't get a lot of attention, but that again, that species is in trouble. And I think there's one in particular that nobody's really focused on because we know so little about it. Is the street reed warbler. So this is a a little brown job that is seen occasionally on migration in the Beijing area, actually, and Herbei coast, not far from here. But nobody has found its breeding grounds. Nobody's ever recorded its song. And the, the only wintering ground that was known in the Philippines, the Kandaba marshes, has been degraded to such an extent that it no longer occurs there. And I think the last sort of confirmed sighting was several years ago now. And so we, that bird, I think, is, is really in trouble. And the breeding grounds are thought to be in northeast China and southeast Russia, but nobody's found them yet. So if somebody wants to make a name for themselves, head up to northeast China next June and find the breeding grounds. And I, for one, will be buying them a drink. Yeah, maybe maybe don't go there if you're an Australian or an American or even a Brit <laughs> at, at this stage. Maybe that's a, a, a great job for a British environmental biologist or an ornithologist. Sorry, a Chinese, wow. a, a Chinese one. Um, the the programs for the... <laughs> the cuckoo and the swift. Tell us about them and tell us why they're important. Yeah, sure. The, the swift, I mean, the swift was what started it really. So as you know, the, the common swift is a, a species that it's a unique species in the sense that it, it's, it spends almost its entire life in the air. It's perfectly adapted for life in the air, eats in the air, drinks in the air, sleeps in the air. And uh, we have them in Europe, right? You know, the, the range goes right from the UK in the west right to, to Beijing in the east and we know that we knew that the UK birds uh, migrate to Africa and there have been groups tracking them in, in Europe for several years and but nobody had ever um, tracked the birds in Beijing and in Beijing it's a very special bird culturally significant because it's it moved into the original city walls when they were built in 1400 old Beijingers used to think that their ancestors came back, the Swifts. So there was this strong cultural connection over many uh, centuries. And um, of course, they love the old buildings uh, in the old hutongs and the, uh, the temples and so on. 
for nesting sites. It provides nice ledges and holes for them to nest on. And of course, in, in recent decades, Beijing has lost a lot of those buildings to be replaced by you know, modern buildings with straight lines, no holes and glass. So the population has been falling um, over many years. And so it actually started with a conversation that I went to a BirdLife International drinks reception in London. I happened to be back at Christmas and I met a guy called Dick Newell, who is a, a big expert and um, swift conservationist. Uh, and he said, oh, has anybody thought about tracking the, the swifts from Beijing? Could be not only will we discover where they go, you know, nobody had ever discovered before, but also it helped to raise awareness about this species. And I knew that the Beijing Birdwatching Society had been studying swifts at Summer Palace, uh, which is an iconic location. Uh, and they've been ringing them, putting metal rings on the legs, you know, with the unique number. And over several years, they'd realized that these swifts are very loyal to their sites. So they came back to the same place year after year. And they also learned roughly how long they live, about seven years. But they didn't, they never knew where they went when they left Beijing. So when I came back to Beijing, I had a chat with them and I said, oh, would you be interested in, in working together to do a project to track them? We'd fund the geolocators, the technology, and we'd just piggyback off their project that they did every year where they caught some swifts at the Summer Palace, ringed them, weighed them, and so on. And they loved the idea. So the following May, we were, there was a group of us at the Summer Palace, including Dick Newell and a couple of other colleagues. And we fitted 30 of these geolocators to, to swifts. And of course, you know, swifts are, are, are small birds. They're very lightweight. So they can't take anything very heavy, including a transmitter. So these, this, uh, these geolocators store the data. They don't transmit it. So you have to come back a year later and catch the same birds. But of course, we knew from the study that the Beijing Bird Watching Society did, that these birds are very loyal to, to the nest site. So we knew we had a good chance of, of getting some of them. And the following year, we were able to trap 13. I think in one hour, we trapped 13 of those 30. And of course, we discovered that they migrate all the way to Southern Africa, so South Africa and Namibia for the winter. And I think one of the, we, there were some people that suspected they would go to Africa rather than Southeast Asia, which might have been the more obvious place and closer closest place that would be easy for them to survive but but sure enough they went to, to southern africa and i think one of the surprises was that actually after leaving beijing they actually head northwest and go north around the himalayas instead of going south and across the arabian sea which is an, it, so it's an incredible journey i think they cross something like 18 borders and i think it's very likely from studies of european swifts that these birds make this journey and back again without landing at all so they spend the whole of that time from end of July to the following April in the air, which is just an incredible story. Nature's full of incredible stories and inspiring stories. And I think, you know, this really caught the attention of, of Beijing. And so once we had this result, we talked to the media and it really got a lot of interest uh, in Chinese media and also international media, which meant that probably millions of people that, that live in Beijing for the first time had this new respect of the, for this swift bird that they're very familiar with, just had this completely new level of respect. And I think you know, one of the unforeseen things in this project actually was that I often go to schools and talk to schools about in Beijing and one of the things we talk about is the swift. And when they hear that the population's going, they hear about this amazing journey and their lifestyle and they say, oh, what can we do to help? And so several schools got together and and make nest boxes for swifts and put them up on their campus um, to provide new homes, you know, which is wonderful. So we've got something like 10 schools now in Beijing doing that. But then one little girl, eight-year-old, put her hand up and said, okay, this is easy, we can make nest boxes, but why don't we write to the bosses of the building companies who make the new buildings and ask them to make them friendly for swifts? You know, what a brilliant idea. So then four... Schools got together, they nominated a SWIFT ambassador each, and those four SWIFT ambassadors to the boss of the most famous company in China. You know, he's a, a very, very famous guy. And he said, yeah, come on. And so they presented the story of it, the migration, the lifestyle, how the population's gone down, what the schools are doing to help. And collectively, they all asked him, you know, can you help? And he stood up and was amazing. He said, I didn't know about this bird. 
we've been making buildings for 20 years to make people's lives better. Now I realize we, we should be making buildings not only for people, but also for wildlife. So he made three commitments. One was to put up, make and put up 200 nest boxes on existing buildings and to integrate the design of swift nest sites into new buildings and also to engage the building sector as a whole across China about making building new buildings better for wildlife, which was an amazing result. You know, completely unintended impact of that swift tracking project, you know, which I found really inspiring. These young people just had this idea and they ran with it and had an incredible outcome. Out of the mouths of babes, isn't that it? <laughs> Terry, I'll, I'll just mention that for anybody who has been unaware of the Beijing Swift and the journey, they need to have a look at your Twitter page and the Burging, Burning Beijing uh, account, mm. and your pinned tweet is the recordings from the, tw I, I guess, the 2016 data, because it's a tweet from 2017. So it's the data of the journey from Beijing down into Africa. And actually, it's they cover a lot of ground in Africa, don't they? And then that journey back where they where they go north of the Himalayas and settle back in, in into the Summer Palace in Beijing. So I would recommend you look up um, Birding Beijing on Twitter and have a look at the pin tweet because, yeah, it's... That animation... The animation, I think, is thirteen dots, coloured dots, and each one is a it's a real swift yeah. making that journey. It's the data from those. Yeah, it's the log data that you've collected after yeah. you've caught them when they've returned back to the nesting site. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot more to say about swifts, but but I want to move on to the cuckoo. Yeah. So the cuckoo has been. I mean, that was the follow. So how do we follow the swift? And another bird that is pretty iconic around across Eurasia, really. It's the cuckoo. You know, everyone knows the, the call. And again, this is a bird that's quite common in Beijing in summer. It's fortunate that in East Asia, it's still a common bird. And uh, they're primarily a wetland bird in Beijing. They parasitize uh, the oriental reed warblers. That's the main host species. And again, this is something that's been done in Europe. So the British Trust for Ornithology has been tracking cuckoos in Britain to try to understand a bit more about their decline because there's been a huge decline in, in, in cuckoos in, in Britain. And in fact, on the, on the first page of the definitive book about cuckoos by, by Nick Davis, um, who studied cuckoos all his life, and he's a great scientist, and you know, he, I thoroughly recommend his book, Cheating by Nature. But on the first page of that, he, it says cuckoos from Europe go to Africa and cuckoos from East Asia winter in South Asia, Southeast Asia. And so that hadn't been proven. That was sort of more speculation. But so we decided to do a project in Beijing with cuckoos. And the great thing about cuckoos is they're a bit heavier than swifts. So they can carry a slightly heavier backpack, as we call it, which includes a transmitter. So that means that we can follow them in near real time. And so we used that opportunity to work with schools. So we fitted five transmitters to cuckoos in Beijing. And uh, we visited schools and we asked the school children to name those cuckoos. And then they could follow them in near real time. We, we would put out the data on, on social media and on a special website. And the schools were fantastic. They came up with some amazing names. And, and perhaps the, the most famous one was, was called Flappy McFlapperson, who was named after... Uh, a fairy. Uh, the yeah, the fairy. Yeah. There was a boat. And um, we had a similar thing in Sydney where they did a public naming competition and got fairy face. Yeah. So there's a theme going there, right? So, And there are a few British students at this school because it, this particular school was an international, international school. school. We worked with Chinese schools as well. So we had sort of a mixture of Chinese names and, and international names. Yeah, so, so Flapping with Flappers, sort of, they put up their, each class nominated a name and then they put them up for a vote in the assembly. <laughs> and Flappy McFlapperson was the one that got the most. And she ended up, this was a female, and she ended up being a, a real star because she went up to Inner Mongolia to breed. So when we caught her in Beijing, actually, she was still migrating. She, was, she hadn't finished her migration. And she went up to Inner, the border of Inner Mongolia and Russia to breed. And then she made this incredible sea crossing into Africa. So we got to October and the birds were all sort of in India and they'd been there about a month, you know, and we thought, okay, they're going to 
maybe winter in India. But of course, they were just waiting for the monsoon winds to change. And as soon as the, the winds changed and started to take the moist air from the Arabian Sea to East Africa instead of India, the winds were helpful. And also there was rain in East Africa and cuckoo's favorite food are soft-bodied insects like caterpillars. Yeah. Um, and they generally emerge just after rain. After that. So it was perfect. Uh, and obviously it was perfect. They've done the, the adapted this migration over millions of years so we shouldn't be surprised but when we see it we all make sense but uh, obviously before you see it you don't necessarily can't necessarily join the dots but that's true they headed south with that spent the winter in mozambique and of course made the journey back and it was incredible the following summer we went with a school to the place where we tagged the cuckoos in beijing and Right in front of our eyes, we saw one of those birds fly across in front of us, and you could see the tag, the aerial. So this was you know, almost exactly a year after we tagged the bird. There it was, back in exactly the same, within 100 metres of where we tagged it, which just shows incredible navigational skills. So that was a fantastic moment. And again, got great media coverage, and I think, we were fortunate in the sense that the New York Times reporter in Beijing, his daughter went to one of the international schools who was involved in this project, and he was completely hooked. And so he wrote a piece on this cuckoo journey from Beijing to Africa, and it actually got onto the front page of the New York Times, you know, which for to have a migratory bird story on the front page of the New York Times was pretty incredible. Yeah, way beyond our expectations. So, so these birds have been fantastic ambassadors you know, for nature, and I think have really inspired a lot of people not only in China, but, but internationally, you know, just to inspire them about nature. Now, the internet played um, tricks on a bit of uh, your answer there, Terry. So could you just detail um, when the monsoon winds changed and the, and the conditions in East Africa were rife, uh, were ripe for the birds? Where did they go? You, I, I caught that you ended, that they ended up in Mozambique, but... But all the bit in between, we didn't quite catch. Okay, so when they were in India, sort of during September, uh, they were there for quite a while. And uh, we thought at that point that they may be set to winter in India. But then the monsoon winds change. So, so what happens in the Arabian Sea is during the summer months, the winds come off the Arabian Sea to the east and northeast, bringing that moist air to India, where they have the rains. And then in the autumn, sort of end of September, those winds change 180 degrees and suddenly the rain stops in India and the rain starts in East Africa. So those winds turn 180 degrees, start blowing sort of west-southwest and taking that moist air to East Africa. And that's the point where the rains start in East Africa. And then gradually over the next few months, those rains move south, uh, slowly. So, so these birds were just literally waiting for in India for that change to happen. So they were enjoying having the moist air in India because that was encouraging the emergence of caterpillars. And then when that rain stops, that's the point where the winds also change. The winds start taking that moist air point where they make the jump. So they leave one area that was great for them while it was being rained on. And they move to this area that is now being rained on, which becomes ideal for them. You know, so it makes perfect sense. And so they, they cross the Arabian Sea into Somalia and down into Kenya, Tanzania, and ended up spending the winter in Mozambique before, before heading back. Those rains in the spring, they start to move north again. So the cuckoos follow that. And then the wind switch again, take the, the moist air to India. And that's the point where they, they cross again. So when you look at it, it look, makes perfect sense. But obviously beforehand, it's difficult to, to join those dots. It raises that big conundrum again from, for us that their migration is so dependent on regular weather patterns. They've evolved to follow regular weather yeah. patterns. So climate change is a, well, it's got to be, an ex unless they're able to change their behaviour rapidly, if the climate change, if the climate patterns change rapidly, well, 
that's an ex- existential threat for them without doubt, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly uh, you know, a, a risk in the future if there, is a, if there is a change to these weather patterns, the monsoon patterns, so that will certainly affect cuckoos and, you know, and probably many other birds as well. There are probably other birds that, that use this similar migration route. We know that ammo falcons take a very similar route too. So they, they also breed, you know, in northeast China, southeast Russia, the Amur River area and, and winter in southern Africa and make that crossing of the Arabian Sea as well. Yeah, and there are probably other birds that, that do that that we're not aware of as yet. So, yeah, certainly you're absolutely right. They're finely tuned to these these weather patterns. And, and so if there are changes to those weather patterns, they could have serious impacts on these birds. Absolutely. Well, that raises an obvious question for you too, Terry. You've involved schools with two of the iconic birds of Beijing. What's the next one? <laughs> What's next? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, lot, it's a, a lot it of obviously ideas. works. Yeah. I mean, it's a formula that works in terms of getting attention to the plight of the of the bird. So, your Absolutely. your method of working with the schools is obviously working because you're getting the payoff in the in the mainstream media that is not just fleeting it seems to be fairly consistent Mm -hmm. and that an interest in the resident birds in the city of beijing seems to be increasing and i think you can take a bit of credit for that because you're continually active (laughs) promoting promoting what's there in the city not only birds i mean you've got a, a much wider sort of remit than that but obviously we're focusing on birds today so i hope you are going to pick out another iconic species oh. and and <laughs> do another project well just i mean just on that the I, I think one of the reasons why we did these projects was to raise awareness about birds in beijing because I, just to tell you a quick story when i first came to beijing you know so many people told me when they found out I was interested in watching birds, so why have you come to Beijing? There's no birds in Beijing. This is what that was the most common response uh, when people found out I was a bird watcher. But of course, the reality is very different. It's the reality is that we've recorded over 500 species in in Beijing, which puts it right near the top of the table. Did some research recently on G20 countries, capital cities, and Beijing is number two behind Brasilia. Beijing is ahead of Washington, D.C., it's ahead of Canberra, it's ahead of London, it's ahead of Paris, Ottawa, all these major cities. And I think when you tell people that, 99 people out of 100 are shocked. They can't believe it. So there's a huge need for raising awareness about birds and the importance of Beijing to birds. And I, and I think not that's the first step. Once you get that knowledge, um, that then comes pride. People have a sense of pride about Beijing being so good for birds and then comes the next step well we want to protect that you know we, we don't want to drop down that table right and we don't want to we want to keep Beijing near the top and we want to once you know about something and you fall in love with it like the swift and the cuckoo we've seen that people want to help them then they want to make sure that the places they need are protected and so it, it creates support for policies that are good for conservation so I think it's hugely important this public awareness uh, raising. And in terms of what we're going to do next, well, we actually had a plan this year that was scuppered by COVID, but we it, it won't be in Beijing, actually. It's going to be in uh, on the Tibetan Plateau. So on the Tibetan Plateau, we're at the, the place I mentioned earlier, the Sanjiang, uh, this huge national park where they have snow leopard, leopards and bears and wolves. To celebrate the fact that it's becoming a national park, what we were planning to do, actually, was to tag some cuckoos there. Because one of the interesting things is that if you follow the migration of the Beijing cuckoos and the Mongolian cuckoos also, you know, they go out of their way to avoid the mountains. They take a look around the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. And, uh, and yet, if you go to the Tibetan Plateau in summer, 4,000 metres above sea level, there are lots of cuckoos. So there's a different subspecies of cuckoo that lives on the plateau that is very poorly known. Now, we're pretty confident that it would go to Africa like the other cuckoos. But, of course, you, you, know, don't, know. you don't know that for sure. Yeah. So, But we, well, the plan is you know, to celebrate sort of this becoming a national park, tag some cuckoos, work with the local people there, you know, give them Tibetan names, 
and see where they go. And the idea would be that they would almost certainly pass through or winter in Af uh, national parks in Africa. So this would link China's national parks with African national parks. And there's so much storytelling here in terms of some of these cuckoos would be mixing with snow leopards. As, you know, and in winter, they'll be mixing with lions and leopards and, and cheetahs you know, in, um, in Africa. You know, and just think of the of all the, the cultures and the wildlife that we see on the way on the migration. So this was going to be a sort of way of celebrating China's national parks becoming a thing, uh, potentially twinning with some of Africa's national parks through migratory birds. Yeah, and so that's a project that we really hope to do next year. Uh, we were not able to do it this year due to the the COVID situation. So you just need to find a cuckoo that's big enough to carry a GoPro. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, well, cameras are the next. I'm sure it's going to happen, right? You know, oh, we'll have the technology. I mean, the, you know, technology is just moving at such a, a rate these days. And uh, and I think the brilliant thing about it is it's opening up this new era of discovery. You know, we're able to use technology to make these amazing discoveries about some of the journeys of the migratory birds that it would be so difficult to discover without uh, this tracking technology. And I think that's what's really exciting about today, right now. Because these stories really inspire people and can really get people into nature. You know, and I think when you look at the global situation of biodiversity loss, this is so important to reconnect people to nature and to get people to be inspired by nature you know, and hopefully build some momentum and support for policies that are going to stop this biodiversity loss, this catastrophic biodiversity loss that we're all experiencing. Can we move on to birding in Beijing? Is there an active is there an active bird watching community in Beijing and is it mostly expats involved in it? Or is is there a real sense of, of locals being involved and committed? Well I think there's been a huge change in ten years. So I mean I, when I first came here I would say that there are probably only half a dozen active bird watchers and probably three or four of them would have been expats. Um, now it's completely different. I mean I'd say 10 years ago, if I went birding, I would have more chance of seeing a first for Beijing than I would another birder. It was that, you know, that um, low number in terms of people involved. But now it's transformed, especially the last three or four years. I think you go to any recognized birding site on any day of the week now, and um, you will see other birders. And the majority of them will be Chinese. So we have a, we have a sort of a WeChat group about birding Beijing, which is like a sort of WhatsApp type system. And, you know, we have about 350, 400 members of that. And the vast majority are Chinese. And there's some brilliant young Chinese birders. And I think the interesting thing is the demographic. Certainly when I was growing up in Britain, it was 90% male, mostly older as well. In China, it's sort of 50-50, maybe even slightly higher numbers of, of ladies rather than men. And very young, and you get families going out birding together, which is fantastic to see. So it's quite an interesting difference in, in the demographic. But there has been a huge explosion in birding in Beijing, and I think in China as a whole, also in the last few years. And I think that's it also you know, that's sort of borne out in terms of the number of new records that we've had in Beijing in the last few years. So people are going out more, and they're finding more more birds, more interesting birds. We're still finding breeding birds in Beijing. Which is incredible, really. You know, and when you think that Beijing is probably the most watched part of China, China, there's a lot of stuff still to discover, for sure. So it, it's an exciting place to burn. It really is. How about the mainstream media environment for natural history kind of information? Like Britain's got the amazing natural history unit with the BBC, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he, here in Australia we've got a, still a fairly active sort of nature division in the in the abc of obviously very similar with documentary programs being churned out in the us what's the situation turning on your, your tv or your streaming service in china are you going to see a lot of locally made local wildlife focused programs or is it nearly all re-edits of international shows yeah well again you know i think Things are changing. So I think 10 years ago, you know, my, the answer would have been it's mostly international programs that are re, 
edited and uh, Chinese subtitles. But now it's overwhelmingly domestic made wildlife programs. And there are more and more of them, you know, on mainstream TV, on mainstream channels. So there's been a huge explosion in that. And I think part of it is that national parks focus on national parks. There's a lot, been a lot of programs about the development of national parks and focused on individual parks and wildlife within them. It's such, just such an easy topic, you know, in China because there's so much of it. There's so much wilderness still and so much wildlife, which is, I know it's different to the image that is often portrayed in the West, but you would go to the Tibetan Plateau, it's just amazing abundance of wildlife and the same as if you go into to northeast china into the forests there i love going there in june it's just amazing bird song beyond anything i've ever experienced in europe so there's more and more wildlife tv now domestically made happening so in the first few years i was here there were some joint sort of ventures between chinese tv and some of the established international groups like Na- national geographic and bbc and so on but now they're they're doing a lot uh, on their own so it's definitely happening. And I think there's a big, you know, this sort of reflects quite a big awakening among the Chinese population on environmental issues. And I think particularly among young people, there are NGOs spotting up, uh, sprouting up all over the country dedicated to, to wildlife and conservation issues. Some are dedicated to specific species like snow leopard or gibbons in Yunnan, for example. And others are more, you know, broad. But, you know, there's been a huge increase in the number of organizations locally working on on these issues and i think that's you know fantastic i think it's still a way behind starting from quite a low base if you look at 10 years ago but i think the direction of travel is really positive you know and I, i've been fortunate to work with some of these local ngos particularly at shan shui conservation center which is based at peking university and they they focus on the Tibetan Plateau, and you know they're doing amazing work up there with the local communities on on conservation and uh, you know, engaging the local communities in in this work. And what I love about them is they're just so enthusiastic and energetic and positive. So it's yeah, I, I mean I can't really sort of overestimate the change that's happened in the last five or ten years. Well, again, it's really positive things to hear, and that's that's all we all we want a positive step day after day. Everything every day, so another bit of good news being announced would be great. Now, I'm going to have to try and get you on again to speak about the regions in China because there's a great untold story there. I think now before we move on to the standard bird emergency questions for our guests so that we can place you on the spectrum, on the bird nerd spectrum. Recently, there's been a bit of controversy. I noticed it on Twitter with Bird BirdLife International and China. Can you make sense of what's happened and do you want to venture any kind of opinion or comment? Because I'm, I don't understand what's going on. Well, I mean, I, I, and I think, but I think, you know, anyone who watches China and what's happening in China will know that the Chinese mainland government, you know, is increasingly strident in terms of the how Taiwan is described. You know, Taiwan is to the Chinese mainland a province, a sort of renegade province, if you like, that will come back to the motherland at some point. And of course, you've seen the pressure that has been put on diplomatically. Um, you know, and commercially, so businesses that want to operate in mainland China, you know, have to show that they respect the the One China policy, as they call it, in terms of the, the mainland China's views. So this is not something that is new or unique to to the conservation world. It's something that is a, a sort of political reality, if you like, that has been showing itself uh, across the whole spectrum of economic activity and NGOs and everything. And it's uh, that's the political reality. And there's, you have, on the one hand, China's view about Taiwan, and you have, the on the other hand, the international community's view of Taiwan. But increasingly, there are so few countries now that have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan because there's been so much pressure. And so if they have relations with with China, but you don't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It's a formal state. So, and so it's, it's a complex issue. It's a rail politic issue. 
it's something that's not going to go away. It's something that's going to, I think, rumble on for for a long time, you know, until mm-hmm. the situation is resolved one way or another. And I think until then, any organizations that engage with mainland China and Taiwan are going to face these issues. And so they have to make very, very difficult decisions based on their aims and objectives. And I think it's very easy to be critical uh, of organizations that perhaps sacrifice Taiwan. But you have to look at the big picture, I think. And it's, it's not about right or wrong here. It's about if you want to have maximum impact in terms of as a conservation organization, you have to work out where that maximum impact is. And if that means having to, to make some trade-offs, then, you know, I think ultimately that's, that's what's got to happen. There's so no, there's no negotiating, to- there's no negotiating <laughs> with China. There, on this issue, <laughs> there's no negotiating with, with, with the Communist Party. No, they have a very strict view on this. And I think any organization that, that works with China and Taiwan will Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just, I, I don't think it's you know, a bad reflection on, on any organization, the decision they take, because the decision they take is, has to be based on their aims as an organization and where they can have the most impact, you know, and, and they've got to work with governments, whatever government is in power in the places where you need to work. And I think if you take a too much of a idealistic view, then you're not going to be working in a lot of countries around the world that are very important. There is the issue, I guess, of the people who have been working out of Taiwan. They need to be accommodated somewhere, though, don't they? They can't just be excommunicated from the from the official sort of bird slash conservation community. They need the well, I, yeah I, no 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 my, no me either. But maybe they need. I mean, they have to be accommodated somewhere else because they've obviously been doing work that must have been useful prior to now. Well, my my name, you know, BirdLife works with partners in in partner organisations in different countries. So so normally it's you know a local organisation in, in a given country or a given territory, however you want to describe them, and not necessarily BirdLife staff that are sent out around the world. Oh yeah, it's yeah, more yeah. like partnerships. You know, I wasn't thinking they were yeah. staff. I'm thinking more the the motivated individuals who who all these organisations rely on. Without volunteers on the ground, there's very little in terms of Yeah, I, I, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'd like to think that anybody, you know, who's working in conservation anywhere in the world wouldn't be, wouldn't change their attitude to the fact that they're no longer a bird life partner. I mean, it, it wouldn't, I mean, if I, if I was a bird life partner in Beijing and, and suddenly I'm not a bird life partner, it wouldn't stop me doing the, no, the no, conservation work. No. I'd absolutely continue to do it because yeah, that's what yeah. I don't, I'm in that world, right? So, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, of course, it's unfortunate, and nobody likes these situations. But I think, without knowing the, the details, it's difficult to comment more than that. Uh, I think the only comment I, I, I'd be prepared to venture is that it's obvious who's going to win in any fight that you come up <laughs> against China. It's obvious who the winner is. <laughs> so, well, I think uh, there's an element of real politics. You know, yeah, and, um, I think you just have to find the best accommodation that you can take account as you said of the real politic and and move on now quickly because i know you've got we're running up against something else that you've booked into what is your favorite bird terry very very difficult question i think if i was really pushed i would probably say the house martin because it's a bird that i grew up with uh, i used to nest on my house my parents house um, and i used to just love the day when they arrived back from africa every spring and it was a magical moment, and I used to just spend many happy hours watching them around the house. So, and it's a bird that I still see occasionally in China. They're quite uncommon here. It's a northern house martin, um, which is the species that we get in the UK, is pretty rare in Beijing as a passage migrant. But I've, I've been fortunate to see it once. <laughs> so, yeah, that would probably be my favourite bird. So, did you have a mulberry tree in your childhood by any chance, Terry? No, I just thought if there are another thing that there's mulberry trees in Beijing, aren't there? So maybe, but yeah, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not a big tree person. Okay. I, mean. I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily recognise it. I just thought it was a ve- <laughs> it was a very nice British memory. Favorite place? <laughs> favorite place to go birding? Favorite place to go birding? Beijing. 
absolutely. And if you push me to say a specific site, I would pick, I'd pick two actually. One would be Lingshan, which is a mountain, Beijing's highest mountain, in the west of the capital. It's about 2,300 meters peak. And I just love it in winter because it always produces surprises. So we occasionally get Tibetan plateau species occurring on this mountain in winter, you know, particularly the red starts, the, the beautiful Himalayan red starts, like Alashan red start and white-throated red start, you know, both of which I've been lucky enough to see there. They really get my heart racing when I see them because they're always, you know, it's rare and special. Uh, so that definitely is my favourite winter birding site. And then for a general birding site, I'd say uh, the area around Yeahu, which is Wild Duck Lake, and Ma Chang, which is right on the northwest border of Beijing. It's a reservoir there. It's a really fantastic place for migration. So spring and autumn, it's just awesome. And I'll be going there this weekend. What's your your greatest wish list bird? What's the one that you always want to catch a glimpse of? Well, I mean, right now, I'd say the bird that I really want to see well and to photograph and to sound record is the street reborn, the one that I mentioned earlier about how rare it is and how it's slipping away really without any attention. Nobody's found the breeding grounds. I have had a look up in northeast China, I haven't had a comprehensive look, it's a huge area, it's a vast area. It would take years really to do it justice and ideally you need teams of people going up at the right time of year, checking lots of different places, but that would be the one bird that I would so want to see and hear doesn't look much when you see it in a book, but to me, that would be something special to find a singing male on territory. So I'm, I'm guessing the answer to this question might be linked, but where's your sort of bucket list, wish list place to go birding? I would say I, I would love to spend more time in Xinjiang. Uh, in northwest China. It's a vast area, a huge province the size of France and Spain combined or something. And it's there's very few birders. I've been there once and just scratched the surface. There's a huge area to the west with a massive valley that goes into Kazakhstan. That area must be absolutely awesome for migration, particularly in autumn. But it's not an easy place to travel to, as I'm sure you're aware. So it's sort of on my uh, it's top of my list. But I think it, it might not uh, be realised for some time. But that's definitely the place I really want to go. I think if you want to find a first in China, that's probably there. You'd have the best chance. Okay. Well, leading up to the final question, which places you on the spectrum. No, actually, no, there's three. What's your field guide of choice? My field guide of choice for Beijing is the Birds of East Asia by Mark Brazil. It's by far the best field guide for this area. Very good. No, no, no difficult choice there. That was an easy one for you. Okay. What's your favourite piece of equipment when you are out in the field and you can choose anything you like? Binoculars. My 8x42 binoculars. Swarovski's to bits. There we go. There's another plug, Mr. Swarovski, if you're listening. I'd, I'd love a sponsor. All right. Now, this is how we place you on the on the spectrum Terry, when you're out birding, are you uh, an obsessive list keeper? Are you ticking off relentlessly or is being out there amongst the birds with your sound recording equipment, which I I will sneak in the last question on that, is an immersive experience or are you a compulsive list keeper? It's an immersive experience for me. It's all about the experience. I've sort of learned in recent years, really, to keep more records. And I certainly do that now, so I will keep a record of all the birds I see. But that doesn't come naturally to me. It's more the experience for me, absolutely. Well, but you're not at one of the extreme ends of the spectrum, so that's nice to hear. Now, Terry, you're the first person that I've interviewed, even but there are more coming up, who are interested in sound recording of birds. So really for probably for nobody else's interest but mine, what's your rig when, you, when you're out recording bird noises? And I'm going to say noises because yeah, it's, so, not, it's not only the songs that you're after. No, I would say, I guess the technical term is vocalisations. Yeah. So I use a, a digital recorder, a Zoom H5, broader microphone, shotgun mic. It's pretty simple setup. It's not the best. It's not the worst. Um, 
but it's good enough for me and it's pretty portable, you know, which isn't important to me as well. So I, I generally will take it with me wherever I go burning just in case um, something is vocalizing unusually. But And then I also have started doing something which is becoming popular in the US and uh, Europe in particular, very li- little in Asia so far is the, the nocturnal migration recording. So actually just recording at night hours from the roof um, to get a sense of the level and, and species diversity, birds that are flying over the apartment at night. And that's been a really it's a massive learning curve. Identifying everything is, but just getting a sense of that, of the migration at night is really fascinating. And I think there's a lot to learn from that, not only uh, in Asia, but I think in other places around the world. It, it just gives a new insight, a new dimension to birding. Yeah, um, definitely. So, yeah. Definitely. Are you using a reflective dish as well? I, I don't use a parabola, no. It's something I'm, I'm thinking about investing in at some point. But, you know, it, it, they're, they're, you know like everything, there are trade-offs. You that's, know? That's For true. me, it's the portability that's the, maybe carrying it off your backpack you know, because you're if, carrying too much stuff. So it's always a trade-off. If you were further up one end of the spectrum, you'd have a parabola. But, but yes, a good, sure. good choice of a recorder. I've, my portable recorder is one of the Zoom six ends, and yeah, I love it to bits. I love it to bits. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think I, I love getting capturing sound recordings now. It's, you know, and, yeah, the, the hope is that at some point you know, I'll be able to have a, some sound recordings of pretty much every Beijing bird on the website. Yeah, uh, well, well, we haven't even really had time to talk about your website, which is well worth a, uh, a look. Of course, I'll be linking to it. But I hope, Terry, that we can have a conversation again, maybe on another Megaphone Monday and sort of talk more about the schools and then the regions, all the regional wildlife assets in China and and some of the iconic species that are beyond uh, the scope of the streets of Beijing. But um, Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I think everyone would love to learn more about China. I certainly would. Terry Townsend? Uh, we haven't even really talked about environmental law. So again, there's a there's another whole uh, subject to open up into. But thanks again for giving me so much of your evening after a, a, a busy day helping to save the, the wildlife of China. It's uh, a pleasure. So thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed the discussion and uh, let's hope we can do it again. Well, we're, we're going to. <laughs> we're certainly. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Great.